Welcome to the Real Estate Secrets Podcast for healthcare professionals, hosted by Austin Hare and Nathan Palmer, who together have over two decades of real estate knowledge and investing. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Commercial Real Estate Secrets. We have a, a great guest today from Canada, Lane Terrio. He is the CEO and founder of Independence Dental Services. He's also the founding director of the second largest DSO in Canada. So, you know, in terms of giving people a background, uh, what was it like? So you obviously, you're a Canadian citizen. So you were born, raised, grew up in Canada, right? Yep. And so like, was there anything that happened early on that led you to believe you were an entrepreneur or you were, you know, um, motivate, more motivated than the average bear, anything like that? Sure. Yeah. I, I guess it happened early in life. Like, you know, so I, I, I moved around a lot when I was a kid, but spent most of my, my youth in Calgary, but I happened to be living in Vancouver at the time, um, you know, when I was in kindergarten and that was my, my, had my first business was washing cars, uh, oh, wash the neighbor's cars. Yeah. Um, and you know, we weren't very good at it. So they'd often bring the cars back uh, and make us fix them up again, but that was enough to get, you know, the candy money going. Um, and I guess that was kind of the first inkling, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, inkling I had. Uh, and then, you know, later on, as I, as I grew up, I, you know, I, I shoveled, you know, we had a lot of snow in Canada. Uh, so I shoveled driveways in the winter, um, you know, as a means of making, making money, which eventually turned into a, a landscaping company. And that's how I sort of put myself through, uh, through university. Um, and, and so were you yeah, hiring a, employees at this stage? Yeah, I had, you know, I, I think the employees, you know, I fired my first employee probably when I was like 18 or 19 years old, just, you know, when I finally needed to help, you know, pushing the lawnmower. Nice. Uh, and yeah, I, I would say it was, it, it, I don't think we were, we were, we were great businessmen, we certainly learned a lot. Oh. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was one heck of an experience, a great job. I was in the best shape of my life, had a great tan. Uh, <laughs> I, I miss that. It was very kind of peaceful, peaceful work. So you kind of learned a little bit um, how to manage people and, and grow a team or at least grow a business because it sounds like it didn't come naturally, but you had the desire, right? And a lot of times that's what's more important than anything else is like, how bad do you want this? Well, absolutely. I was far from a natural. Uh, I actually spent, you know, most, most of my life has been spent kind of making mistakes in an effort to, you know, to be successful. Uh, and really, you know, things, uh, you know, kind of unfortunately, you know, the, the moment that sort of changed me in my life was the passing of my father. So when I was uh, 24 years old, my, my, my father passed away and I sort of had, you know, no more, no safety net was gone. And I had to uh, really think about what, what I wanted to do with my life. And that was kind of the moment where, uh, you know, I started really buckling down and, and focusing on uh, a little harder instead of kind of being a little willy nilly and all over the place. So. That was the, you know, the silver lining from that, you know, event in my life. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So that was like the, one of the deciding moments in your life. So was that like 24, sounds like you would have been just out of college. Is that when you decided to go into investment banking? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. So I, uh, I graduated university in 2008, uh, which is not a great time to be <laughs> a job market. Um, and so, and then it was also the same year that my, uh, my father died. And so, uh, you know, I made the decision to uh, enroll in CFA and, you know, look for, you know, so I was working as a sales guy, um, you know, for a, a consulting firm and, um, you know, I decided, okay, this is not, not really what I'm doing. I need to get, get into, into the finance world and made the decision that that's what I was going to do is I was going to become an investment banker, uh, and then spent, you know, kind of the next five years pursuing that. I'm banging my head against a wall and uh, eventually you know I, I ended up getting a job as a as a stockbroker you know, wealth advisor whatever you want to call it uh, just to get some kind of CFA hours but it was gave me some latitude to kind of go out and keep talking to guys in the business and you know I, I met with one one uh, one guy who said you know if you're really serious about you know getting into banking you should probably go back and do your MBA um, and so you know after kind of struggling and still not finding a job I I, I enrolled at uh, the University of Toronto's MBA program um, and fa found that I actually had a lot more finance experience than a lot of my peers who were trying to do the same thing. Uh, and so was that, yeah, it was a great decision, um, made some, you know, some great relationships, but yeah, came out of it with a, a role at uh, Citigroup, 
uh, you know, big U.S. bank uh, in their investment bank, working in the mergers and acquisition department. Uh, and you know, after spending a, a few years there, kind of realized, you know, that I don't think this is for me. <laughs> you know, you work to work, you work really hard for something, but then you get there and you're kind of like, hey, this isn't really what I, I thought it was going to be. Um, it just what was it about that that you, that you didn't like? You know, it wasn't a very entrepreneurial place, mm. and you know, they kind of the expectations just kind of keep your head down and 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 do your work and it, it made it difficult to kind of shine and 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 be exceptional and I kind of rise the ranks right um and as much as they sort of claim it's like a meritocracy there's not there's not much you can do to advance yourself other than sort of having the passage of time and I just found that to be very very frustrating mm. um and you know I I can remember going to my boss with ideas that we could pitch to clients and him Kind of telling me they weren't they weren't very good ideas and i you know later on i realized i think he just didn't want to do the work i think you know i think he was content with where he'd gone to in life and so um you know that that created friction between us uh and eventually you know resulted in me kind of waiting for my bonus to to, to cash and getting out of the the system and so that's what was the ultimately the the precursor to to leaving to start you know out on my own so what about the good things too? Because obviously, you know, every job, there's no perfect job. They all have good things, they all have bad things. What were some of your big takeaways from working there? Oh, okay. So the best part of working in the investment bank is just the sheer amount of uh, information and, and knowledge that you get, right? And you get to under, I, for me, you know, I learned about a ton of these different industries. We were really generalists. So I got to see under the hood of, you know, so many different businesses um, and then, uh, which I just found fascinating. And then the other thing is you kind of understand, you start, I started to understand the fabric of how business and deals work and right, all the elements that, that kind of come together and what are the norms uh, in business that you know, I'm still, I still use to this day. And right, once you understand that framework, it's very powerful because you can now, you sort of have a seat at the table, right? You can talk in that language uh, and you understand how, how all the pieces connect, uh, which has been yeah, a, a, a instrumental for, you know, I couldn't do what I do today without having had that, that knowledge. Mm. Mm, that's good. And so it was during that time when you realized, okay, you know, I'm doing this for a big company or a big corporation, but I could go out and do this on my own. Is that kind of what the line of thinking was? Yeah. And so in, uh, in, in Canada, the, you know, the private equity world is, is largely dominated by uh, pension funds. There's not a lot of big private equity companies in, in Canada. Uh, and so, you know, one of my jobs there was to kind of maintain a, you know, a database and a, you know, a kind of an information package um, for, for what these pension funds own in their, in their private equity portfolios. And that's where I, you know, I kind of saw this, this common thread among, you know, a lot of the, the holdings that they had, which was that they were all these, what I would call consolidation platforms or you know, pursuing a roll-up strategy. And so, you know, that, that's kind of the, the first first opportunity I had to get exposure to, to this strategy, right? Where, you know, you can go into an industry and, and buy, you know, individual businesses and you know, they're priced at a you know, lower multiple of earnings. And when you put stitch them together in a big platform, you know, they're worth a lot more. Um, and so I had the idea that, you know, maybe, maybe I could go out and, and, you know, find some of these businesses, put them together and, and create a platform myself. Um, and so that was ultimately kind of what, what led me down, you know, my current path. Didn't, didn't really know what industry I you know, wanted to, to pursue. Uh, and so looked at, you know, kind of everything under the sun from like daycare centers to collision repairs to shops, like, like you name it, uh, and a bunch of healthcare stuff. Um, and it was really only out of you know, frustration of not kind of spinning my wheels for a while and not to being able to decide which industry that you know, I sat down with my partner one day and we sort of made like a little matrix to determine what, um, you know, what the, the ideal industry for us to pursue was. And, uh, you know, long story short, all, you know, all the healthcare ones sort of did quite well, but dentistry was just this clear standout. So that was the moment, um, you know, where I made the decision, okay, hey, we're going to go and, and start a, a dental roll-up company. So how long did you spend? Because I know you said you waited to your bonus. I'm guessing that money bought you some time. I mean, how long did you spend pursuing other industries or, or just different industries? Yeah, I, I I mean, it was at least a couple months. I was, yeah, so I got my bonus, got me a little bit of the way there. I'd also been pretty lucky that I'd done actually some real estate deals, which is, you know, sort of also what intrigued me to, uh, to come join you here today. Um, and had, had uh, you know, sold down, I had, a, I had a condo that I was renting out as like an executive rental back in my hometown of Calgary. And, um, and then we'd done, I had like a, a little kind of slum apartment building um, that I had, had, had 
uh, saved from a gun on tax sale um, and sort of fixed up just outside of Toronto. So, uh, and so that, your- that gave me, yeah, go ahead. How old are you when you got your first real estate acquisition? Was it during college? I, yeah. So my, I guess my first, like, yeah, that first one that I didn't live in that wasn't my home, uh, I, it would have been right around the time I took my, I got a signing bonus when I joined the bank. I took the signing bonus and that was the down payment on a, a house in Calgary. It was a little corner lot, uh, kind of in the inner city on like, you know, we've got these, it was a 50 foot lot with a, with a, old, with a World War II era bungalow on it. Um, oh. And it had, it had, you know, a, a t- two suites. There was an up down two units. So I could, you know, my, my yield was pretty darn good on the thing. And I thought, you know, it's on a nice corner lot, uh, you know, eventually some, and if you look down the street, you know, it was kind of an old house. And then on the same size of lot, there would be two sort of infills. Uh, and so that, that, you know, was happening all over Calgary. So I thought, Hey, you know, so eventually some developers going to you know, buy this thing and, you know, maybe there's some good value here. Is that um, what happened? Or do you, so, you still have it? Yeah. I, so I did, I did end up selling it, got, uh, got pretty lucky with the t- timing because this would have been in 2014 and you know Calgary's a big oil town and so this is when you know sort of the oil oil crash was just about to happen and so yeah it's exactly a developer came in I only owned the property for you know maybe two years um and then a developer came in and bought it and you know he I kind of just got lucky because the uh the market sort of fell out right under uh, have you calculated what, what percentage your ROI was including you know the rental that you have for two years Geez, I, you know, I paid like a low, low 400s for the, for the place. I want to say it's like 420 grand, something like that. And I think we sold it for just over 500. Nice. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, I, you know, I'm trying to, th- yeah, I had, it was, a, we, we must have done it because like my bonus that year was only like 40,000 bucks. So there's no way I could have put 20% down on it. So I bet you it was a, you know, a 5% down kind of deal in Canada. We have these CMHC type financing where you can get, High leverage if you're, you're um, if you, you claim you're going to live in the home, right? So uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that's what I did. <laughs> so yeah, the, the the return was 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 probably pretty good, probably in the you know two three x over nice. a couple year period. Nice. And then you were positive cash flow uh, along the way when you're renting it out. Yeah, I mean when you can get two units out of one, right? Yeah. Just breaking up that uh, that unit, right? If if I rented the whole house. I probably would have taken it and gotten, you know, 30% less rent. So yeah, it cash flowed quite well out of the gate. I think I, I'll have to pull up my, my spreadsheet, send it to you one of these days. But uh, I think I had a, you know, cash on cash yield was like way in the teens just on yeah. that basis. It makes sense. People like privacy, you know, because I've got a couple Airbnbs and I tried the individual room thing. Um, you know, and you could rent an individual room. Maybe it was like 50, $60 a night. But if you rent the you know, three bedroom, the whole unit, like privately, I mean, now you're looking at 250, $300 a night, right? And so it's like, people will pay that extra amount for privacy. So splitting up a house like that into a duplex, like they'll pay a little bit extra per square foot for sure, if they're going to be getting privacy. So that makes total sense. And then after that, what was, did you continue, like, were you buying real estate along the way, uh, you know, personally while you had your job or did, when you sold it, did you reinvest that into, into more real estate? So yeah, no. When I, when I uh, you know, I finally left the, my my role. I needed all, all the cash to kind of get me through, um, you know, to the to the end of the to the big deal. So I had sold it all down. But yeah, I, you know, during that time, for leading up to that, you know, I, I created some wealth that allowed me to to have that take that you know two year period where I basically had no income uh, to go and put the deal together. So you know, turned my I had a condo that I was living in in Calgary before I went to. Uh, university and t- turned that into uh, uh, an executive rental. So I was renting it out by the month. Uh, oh. Did do a little air, you know, I did Airbnb when I couldn't get someone in there for the whole month. Um, oh. So that's where I got my first uh, taste of Airbnb. And uh, it was, it was, I only had one bad experience uh, where a, a prostitute got uh, a hold of the place and was hosting her Johns there, um, oh. which is, is interesting dealing with the fallout of that. But other than that, actually, it was uh, it was a great experience, and and we made made uh, you know some good good money on it. Um, but yeah, eventually, just I needed the cash, so I had to sell it. And then uh, the other deal we did in in Toronto, actually, it was outside of Toronto, a little town called Marmara. My my partner, who I I worked on my first uh, dental business in Canada, 
um, you know, he he had identified that there was these, these tax sales happening in in Ontario, where you know, if you don't pay your mortgage, right, it goes to a a power sale, right? The bank will sell your house to collect on the mortgage. Well, if you don't pay your taxes, your property taxes, the city will sell your house um, or your property. And uh, so usually, you know, these are very, very distressed situations because if there was a bank that was involved, they've basically stepped away. They've, you know, they figured it's not worth their time. Uh, wow. And so we found a, a little uh, apartment building in this little town that, you know, and was a, a mining town in like the, around the turn of the century and not really a lot going on there. Um, but it was, you know, there were four suites and we, we bid 40 grand for it and won. Uh, so I got, you know, 10,000 bucks per unit. I thought wow. it was a pretty good deal. Like, you know, if this was four walls and a roof there, I'm sure we can make something out of it. And then that led us to, to find out that actually the whole kind of corner had been owned by this, 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 uh, this character uh, who had gotten into to trouble and had abandoned the place and the town really wanted it cleaned up. Um, and the banks, uh, who owned the other two parcels, you know, wanted nothing to do with, it. I can remember calling this, this banker said, yeah, well, you know, I'd like to talk to you about this property in, in Marmara that you have. He says, Oh, what is it this time? And I said, no, no, it's your lucky day. I'd like to, uh, like to buy the paper. So, um, and he says, okay, well, what are you going to pay me? I, I said, well, we'll give you 5,000 bucks. I think the face value of the mortgage was close to 200,000. And he says, ah, could you make it 10? <laughs> and we actually said, we actually held our ground and said, no, like, you know, we're going to have legal costs on this. Like, I think the best I can do is 5,000. He says, okay, we'll do the deal. Wow. And so we paid, we paid 20,000 bucks to uh, a fancy lawyer who specialized in foreclosures, which are actually quite rare in, in Canada um and never actually found the guy to deliver you know to serve him um and then eventually so you know the, the units were not that bad you know they needed the carpets had been re recently replaced they de you know they needed paint and, and some new the appliances had all been you know removed uh so we bought some new appliances uh you know painted the place up. There was, you know, some minor electrical work, minor plumbing work that needed to be done. Uh, and we had to redo the roof on one of the buildings. Um, and then we got, we got, so once we got the first property stabilized, we used that to do the, we, you know, we refinanced, got a, you know, a, a, like an expensive mortgage from, you know, somebody who does these, you know, off market, private, you know, private individual mortgage, use that money to fix up the second building. Um, and then, uh, man, I think we sold the property. So our total cost in was maybe two hundred thousand bucks, but we, we didn't have we, we were rolling right all of our our, our our first kind of initial money. So we were probably only in equity for like seventy thousand, uh, and then sold the property for six fifty, but with a, like a mega VTB. So the I think we took back a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage, but we were done with it. Right, uh, wow. and eventually they the, the woman who took it over she was a local who had a bunch of uh, apartments in the area. She, uh, uh, you know, she eventually flipped it as well. I'm sure, sure she made a a bunch of money on it too, uh, and we got our we got our VTV money back. So that was a it was a great uh, great outcome. And that you know between those you know, those three properties, that was enough to to you know keep me paying for my expensive Toronto condo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those two years while uh, while we were waiting to get our independent or, our, or the one, two, three dentist deal done. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so it's cool like how you can utilize things like that, especially in real estate, you know, to supplement your other income. Like a lot of people, I think, just feel that real estate is too expensive or, or it's too hard or it's a rich man's game or something like that. But I mean, you know, you really, a lot of times, maybe as little as 10,000, maybe $20,000, you know, can get you started in a single family or at least a small residential home. And that can make all the difference because that's your, that's your starting platform. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and I'd even say that, you know, some of the better opportunities are in those markets where, you know, property values nominally aren't, aren't, aren't very high, like where you can buy a house for a hundred thousand um, know, dollars. Those tend to be some of the markets with the best opportunities. Right. So, you know, a, Coming from Toronto, you know, property prices are extremely expensive, and it is prohibitive for people to get into that. But if you get into some of these kind of B markets, 
know, that's where you can, you can really add a lot of value and it's not a, you know, it's not something crazy to, to get into for, for an amateur. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. You know, I think it, there's kind of like a, a little bit of a, of a step, like chronological steps that you go through, at least in my mind. And it's, you know, with residential, it's just, it's not, it, the problem with residential is that a single unit doesn't scale very well. Right. So you got to have lots and lots of units. And the other problem is that each unit takes up your time and you only have so much time. And a lot of people think of it as passive income. It's not really passive income. It's a small little business, but the benefit is that it just takes a lot less capital to get started. And so, like you said, maybe in a B level or C level market, you can find one of these lower cost homes and that's your break entry point because I think it's a good way to get started, get your, your feet wet, especially if you don't have a lot of capital. I mean, anybody, almost anybody can come up with 10 grand or, or 20 grand. Like if you get a little bit of time, right. And so then after that, then you can start scaling to maybe some more multifamily, maybe it's a duplex or a quadplex, or maybe it's a little bit bigger. And then after that, like commercial real estate does scale infinitely, but they just, they're a lot more expensive first, like to start off with, and then they require a higher down payment, right? So a million dollar commercial real estate building might require 250, $300,000 down. And so that does take a lot longer to come up with, but you can kind of go through these steps. Like you don't just necessarily start at commercial real estate. You know, you can start with residential and then as you're, you're growing, you know, your finances, then you can kind of scale into uh, commercial because now, you know, a hundred thousand dollar house will get you maybe a thousand dollars a month in rent. A million dollar house isn't going to get you $10,000. It just doesn't scale like that, but, but commercial does. And so I think it's like, it's interesting to hear these stories because a lot of people follow this kind of unwritten, um, you know, order of, of operations before they get there. So yeah, it's really cool. And so then that was about the time. So you, that kind of floated you, you know, your real estate, uh, which was a side hustle really <laughs> floated you yeah. while you were kind of putting this whole thing together and while you're figuring this out. So you mentioned earlier that you had a, a checklist and I think that's, that's funny. Cause that's what we do as well. Um, when we're looking for locations, like because there's so much data, there's so much information, right? So we like to really collect a ton of data and then use a numbering system for each column that we're looking at, you know? And then after the end, it gives you a lot more clarity when you can say, oh, wow, this is this is like, this scored a 79 out of 100, you know, the next closest one is 50 or whatever it is. So what were some of like the the um, metrics that you guys were looking at when you were looking, when you're deciding which industry to go into? Uh, yeah, so that, and it's, it's uh, it sounds very similar. So it's basically exactly what we just like a scoring system, and it's totally unscientific and it's naive, right? And it, it you know it's just uh, a way to put sort of relative value on things, right? And who knows, you know, what's what's the right way to do and what isn't? But uh, yeah, all, uh, that's exactly what we did. And we so we had to, we took out a, basically a blank piece of paper, wrote down all of the industries that we wanted to, you know, we were we had been researching. Uh, so there's maybe about 20 different industries. So wrote those down on the left side of the page and then across the top we put all the metrics that we were we were interested in and so you know the, the first one for us was the industry has to be large right? it's got to be lots of stuff to buy uh, it had to be highly fragmented right there were no big players in the market who kind of dominated um, we wanted the quality of revenue to be high right so that's an, is, this, is this thing recession proof is it stable right um, and uh, we also want it to be growing, right? So if, if we get, those are probably the, the, the biggest ones. And then we also had a, a social impact one, right? So, you know, didn't want to be in any kind of polluting industries or, you know, you know industries that may be considered like predatory, right? Like we, uh, you know, we looked at like a payday lending business, for example, and, you know, that, that we felt a didn't unethical. well uh, from, a, from a social uh, responsibility point, right? So, uh, and then, you know, created like a, a, you know, big matrix and just kind of put a zero, one or a two in each box and added them up, you know, equally weighted them all, which probably wasn't, you know, not, not wasn't the, the right way to do it, but it was enough to sort of, um, you know, break the, uh, you know, the, the freeze that we had had and sort of get the, get us unjammed up so we could pursue something. And that's where we, where we discovered that dentistry was kind of this clear standout for us. Okay, cool. So spent some time, looked at your metrics figure out what, what it is that you were enough, like, you know, incongruence with enough personally and also financially. And then what was the next step after that? So after that, um, we, we started talking to the brokers who sold dental clinics and saying, you know, hey, I want to buy some dental clinics, you know, what do you got? Uh, and so I had a meeting with, with one broker who, who says, well, listen, Lane, if you want to, if you want to get into this this dental space, you got to talk to kind of the grandfather of uh, corporate dentistry in Canada, who was this fellow Dr. Howard Brockett. And so he set us up with a meeting with, with Howard and um, 
we, we end up, we go to meet Howard at a restaurant and we, we sit down and we're kind of explaining to him what we want to do. And he's kind of politely nodding and not saying a lot. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy is, you know, this, we're not, we're not landing. Uh, and so at the end, he says, you know, guys, I get, we, I get one of you comes down here about, you know, every month and you know, trying to do the same thing that you guys want to do. But I, I think you guys are the first ones who might actually be able to pull this off. So I'm, oh, I'm going to help you. I'm so shocked. Okay, great. Right. Uh, but he says, you know, my, my time's not free. <laughs> so I want to, you know, a $10,000 retainer and, but I'll, I'll help you guys get, get started. And so, you know, we left the meeting kind of going, is this guy hustling us? What, what's going on? Um, but eventually decided that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a huge amount of money. Um, and, you know, it was, it was worth the risk. And so, you know, we, we paid him and uh, it, boy, was it worth it because he, he set us up with kind of the, you know, the right lawyers to structure the deal, the accountants uh, who could help us out from a, from a structuring perspective and introduce us to kind of their clients who were, who were dental clinic owners uh, all of his kind of former doctors from his business is he, you know, he'd run, he had 107 clinics at, at his peak. Uh, and some of those doctors were still in business. Uh, and then later on, we found out that, you know, now I'm very close with Howard. Um, he didn't even need the money. He just wanted to see if we were serious. Uh, and so he, he uh, you know, eventually introduced us to, you know, the formative partners that uh, helped us launch our, our business. Do you think it was your, your background in m a that helped you guys, you know, win him over? I, I think so. I think there was a little more of a, a seriousness in the fact that we, we were not dentists. Because um, I think a lot of the folks who, who wanted to do this were dentists and he had, you know, kind of a biased view maybe towards them, you know, and, you know, I, I love my dentist partners. Uh, but, and some of them are great business people, but the majority of them you know, are not, right? Uh, so I think that definitely uh, played a factor. Um, but I, yeah, I think it was, um, you know, sh showing that we were prepared to, to put our own money in and that we were, you know, we were serious about what we were really going to do. We we're going to follow through. I think, I think that's what, what got them on board. Mm, that's great. Okay. So, um, what was it, how was the growth process like after that? How, how many, how many did you start out with and how many did you, were you able to grow it up to? Sure. So, I mean, it took us forever. Well, it felt like forever to put together the first deal. So we, we stitched together. 13 dental clinics, uh, some in BC, some in Ontario. Um, and that was kind of our, our initial group. And so we closed that transaction in the summer of 2017. And, you know, at first it was really slow going, but, you know, uh, eventually we, we started to get uh, a lot of traction. So it, we, we, we grew pretty rapidly, uh, especially in kind of the last, uh, over that two year period ahead of, uh, you know, our, our private equity deal in 2019. So we grew from 13 to 70 clinics and, and it was almost two years to the day, which was the same point in time where we sold a, you know, pretty significant stake of the business to a, a private equity company in Canada called Peloton. And so that was a, a great moment for me because the share price in that deal was a 93% premium to the share price, um, you know, that we, we issued shares at in our 13 clinic deal only only two years prior. So, um, you know, that was enough to crystallize my, my stake in the company, but was, um, you know, a, a, a little bittersweet in the sense that uh, I was politely asked to resign from the board uh, along with uh, most of my board mates to make way for, for Peloton's new slate of directors. So yeah. that's what, yeah, got me out of that uh, and into, you know, created opportunity for, for something new. Right. Yeah. So in hindsight, I'm sure you probably look at that as a blessing, but at the time, I mean, were you wanting to stay on board, you know, indefinitely for the foreseeable future to help them continue to grow? I was a little bummed out, but it, I kind of expected it. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, I, I don't know that I necessarily had the expertise to, you know, be you know, the, on the board of a, you know, when at the, you know, it was now multi hundred, you know, the company's enterprise value was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and I, you know, only three or four years earlier, I was an associate in an investment bank, you know, it, it, <laughs> it might, it maybe wasn't uh, the right role for me. Um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It was, um, it, it ended up being a, a, a huge blessing in disguise because it gave me the space to go and uh, pursue, 
other opportunities. Uh, and, you know, here I am, I'm now the, you know, the CEO of a, of a private equity backed dental roll up that is sort of on a similar path. So mm. yeah, it worked out. What, um, so how did you transition from, you know, to, from Canada to America? What made you decide to start doing business here in the state side? Sure. So, you know, I really, it really was, you know, a desire to not compete with my, my former colleagues. Um, you know, I wasn't really caught up with a, a non-compete, but, you know, I'm sure I signed a confidentiality agreement or something that, that would have made it difficult for me to, to do business uh, here in Canada. Um, but really, it was just about, you know, the fact that we would created a, a really formidable competitor with 123 and, you know, Dental Corp sort of was playing in, or that's our big competitor here in Canada. They were kind of playing on one side of the market and we had carved out a niche in, a, in another area of the market. And so there, I, I didn't really see an opportunity to create a differentiated platform that I thought could be successful competing against, you know, these two sort of giants now. Um, but I didn't see a lot of people doing what we were doing in Canada stateside um, and still saw just a, you know, a, I saw a really big market and I thought, you know, there's got to be some opportunity down there. So that's what got me to start knocking on doors uh, stateside um, and you know having done it once before you really kind of took the the playbook uh, you know had all the templates I had you know term sheet samples I could use right marketing you know materials that I'd already created financial models I had already created um, and so I took those down uh, to the U.S. and uh, it was actually um, what the, the second highest bidder for one, two, three, the unsuccessful bidder that lost out to Peloton, you know, I became friends with, with, you know, the, one of the guys on the deal team there. And, you know, he wrote me a, a, a nice letter that basically said, you know, we're really interested in, in what Lane's doing and, you know, we're, we're looking to, to back him on his, you know, on his platform. And so I kind of took that letter and started talking to the broker says, look, I, I don't have financing, you know, it's not committed. But you know, I've done this once before. Who are the guys who bought you out up in Canada? Well, this is not the guys who bought us out. It was another company, so we ran a process. Okay. Uh, so that stake in one, two, three, and so we got a number of bids came in, and then you know we picked two parties to kind of go into the deep diligence and and further refine their offer. Um. So um, it was a it was another company, another private equity company, that that was the second highest bidder who, you know, I became friends with this guy and, you know, he, he wrote me the nice letter that, okay. you know, kind of gave me credibility in the U S market. So, um, so yeah, started talking to the, you know, the brokers again, you know, I think that's one nice thing about the U S is you guys have a much more developed kind of broker market here. And I think there's a lot more, a lot more, you know, clinics flow through the, the broker channel. Um, and that was a nice way of getting some, you know, when you go through a broker, I mean, this is somebody who has made the decision to transact. Right. And so you can get, you're, you can get deals uh, going, you know, quite quickly versus, you know, in Canada, we'd, we'd be talking to a lot of dentists trying to get them to sell us their clinic. And, you know, we might start a conversation a year, two years ahead of when they actually want to transact. Right. And so when you're trying to get something off the ground, like you don't have time to wait. So um, at, yeah, you know, got a few good opportunities uh, through these brokers off the hop and signed, I basically set up a, uh, in all of my term sheets, I created a clause that says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create a new platform. I was very upfront with them. And I need to have a certain you know, level of EBITDA across the platform before I can actually close on your clinic. So I'm going to pay you, you know, a good price. I paid you know, some premium prices for the first few. Uh, but I'm not going to, when you sign this, I'm not going to start doing the work on the diligence. I'm not going to start doing any of that until I go and sign a bunch of these other term sheets that all add up to, you know, 5 million bucks of EBITDA. And so signed kind of the first two and I had an expiration date. I had to do it in three months. So I signed the first two and then I had kind of a long drought until, you know, I had days remaining before, you know, that, um, that three month wow. uh, timeline to get the, the deal size um, wrapped up before signing the last, the last term sheet. Um, and then uh, from there, you know, we started to work on, you know, financial diligence, a big part of, uh, um, you know, the M&A transactions is to do what's called a quality of earnings uh, report, right, where you go and get up, you know, usually a big four accounting firm to get their logo on, you know, a report that says, you know, we've verified that these are the earnings, right, they'll go and look at the bank statements and all the production reports and 
tax returns to determine that you know the earnings are real and it, it's expensive right you got to spend money to do it so i you know but i've got enough kind of deal size together um and so you, you know start spending money and then COVID hits right and, and you know the the financing that i'd contemplated with my my buddy there you know he's he's no, no longer interested <laughs> right um and so now i've got you know spent a bunch of money I've got clinics that you know i can't possibly close on no one can close on they're not open right so we sort of you know bided our time um and then eventually you know we're coming you know in the summer things start getting better the clinics are open there's all this pent-up demand you know the clinics are going things are going quite well but you know still a really tough time to be up raising money it was you know just the sentiment was so bad. I can't tell you how many people I would call and they'd just say, you know, we're not buying anything right now. We're not looking at, at any at, at any point in time during COVID, were you just thinking to yourself, wow, what have I gotten into? Like, were you worried that the whole thing might just go up in flames because of the pandemic? Oh, oh for sure. Uh, you know, I, I would many times I would calculate exactly how much money I, I owed to these people <laughs> and how much I was going to lose. Right. Um, and it was usually before like starting a new piece of work. Um, Right, that I go, geez, to kind of really afford to get keep going on this. Um, so yeah, there was there was definitely moments where I thought I was gonna have to pack it in. Um, yeah, it was scary times in March and April. It was, yeah, for sure. Um, but you know, it, it sentiment was turning, and I sort of made the decision. I said, this will pass. That you know, nice. we're gonna get through this. It will it will get better. Uh, it's not gonna get worse. And my sort of philosophy was just keep growing, just keep keep finding other partners to grow. Because the, the bigger my package is, the more attractive it's going to be, you know, to a, yeah. uh, a third party. Um, no, that's so, good. You know, humans yeah. are are really resilient. Uh, you know, so it's so easy to look at in the midst of all of it and think like, this is it, this is the end. Like we're going down. We, you know, we'll never be able to recover. The markets will crash. The housing will crash. Everybody will be unemployed. We're all going to die. <laughs> but like you know, we're humans are pretty good problem solvers. And anytime you bet like long term against the market against human ingenuity, you usually lose. And so it's hard to stay focused, stay true to the point, like stay true to your your goals at during the time of crisis. But it sounds like you did that. And it sounds like that's when it really started to pay off for you guys is right after we started coming out of that. Well, it actually gets worse. Um, oh. So yeah, <laughs> so that you know, I, I finally found, you know, someone who was willing to invest and so we signed a, a term sheet with them to to finance us but and and i thought the guy was you know serious and so we you know we start working through the process to get him all the information he needs and you know eventually he starts asking for strange things like he wants us to drop certain deals and he wants to you know there's a point where he said listen i think you need to your management team's a little too big you guys should cut some of these guys i'm going this is not, that doesn't work for me. Like we're, he's trying, he, you know, he was, he was trying to make excuses to not do the deal. And I sort of realized, you know, this guy was just really kicking tires. Uh, and so we ended up wasting a whole bunch of more time on, you know, another financier. And meanwhile, you know, the doctors, some of whom, you know, we signed term sheets with initially in like November of the prior year. You know, this is maybe September now are going, you know, Lane, are you, are you sure you're going to be able to get this it's done right because we're we're starting to lose faith and there's other opportunities that, that are coming along um and so that's when i i made the decision to um engage uh, an investment bank that that specialized in in dental in dental financing this is the logan logan growth advisors who we hired and you know i told them like look guys i'm running out of time i need to get something done quick and they said well we don't know if we can pull it off but but we'll try. So I had to, you know, I had to cough up even more money to pay them a retainer. Um, and just, uh, we had, we had ex gotten extensions from all the doctors and they're the, la the latest extension we got ended in, uh, on November 30th. And we started working with Logan, maybe, you know, the end of September. And so they, we'd only gotten a month where they finally, we finally got an offer from the firm and guys. Mm. And so I said, listen, I'll accept the offer, but I need a letter from you showing that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're going to finance this deal uh, and you're going to have to help me talk to some of these doctors. So, you know, sign that. And like literally the next day we're on the phone that, you know, the, the brokers are having meetings behind our backs saying, you know, we don't think Lane can close. 
And like literally in the nick of time, I was like, oh no, here's my new partner. And we're, you know, we're proceeding, you know, to get this thing done by the end of the year. And, and, and thank, thank goodness for the firm and guys, they really delivered for us. And they, they, they uh, they're fantastic to deal with. They got the deal done in the timeline. They said they would, it, it wasn't without hiccups, but yeah, they, uh, they delivered and we, and we got it across the line. So yeah, it was a nail biter all the way through. Wow. Okay. And so I got a couple of questions too, because you know, you mentioned the thing about the brokers and the fact that these are, they're finding people who are ready to transact, but this also seems like part of your model is they're retaining ownership and they are staying on board for a long time. And which is obviously a good sign. I mean, that's what you want. You want somebody who's faithful enough and bullish enough in their business that they want to continue to grow it. But that seems like a hard mix. That seems like a hard, um, you know, a, a rare combination of people that are willing to transact, but at the same time, they want to stay on board. I mean, how, how hard is it to find uh, people like that? Yeah, you know, that's, that's I suppose you're, you're, that's right. I think the market in, in dental has sort of created a, um, you know, a perception, or I guess, put it to this way, that the, everyone on my side of the table wants the doctors to stick around, right? And so, and will typically pay up if you're willing to stick around, right? And so if you want to do a walkaway deal, you're going to get a lot less money, mm. right? Um, and so doctors have kind of gotten aware of this and, you know, they, you know, a lot of these guys are coin operated. They want to get as much money as they can. So they know that they've got to stick around. So I'd say there are, there are a lot more people now who are willing to stick around because they know that they, you know, it's worth their time mm. uh, to do that. So I think that uh, has, has really helped us keep, keep folks uh, engaged, but yeah, I mean, they're at, at the same time, you know, selling your clinic and having another dog, like say if another doctor bought the clinic, you know, he's buying a job. He doesn't want you working there anymore. Right. Those are his patients that he's going to work now. And so, you know, selling your clinic isn't just, you're not just getting a bunch of money. You're kind of losing your lifestyle, right? You're losing your, your friend network, right? The people that you, that you don't love that you go and see every day. And so when you, when you work with us, you get to keep your job, right? You get to keep coming back. You're just doing it with, you know, a whole bunch of cash in your pocket now that you didn't have uh, the day before. And you can go right? and in real estate on the side. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> um, and and in, in fact, you know, a lot of these guys uh, retain the real estate, right? So they actually become our landlord uh, out of that deal, right? And so, um, you know, they we provide them, you know, with an income stream that they can continue to have with that that existing real estate investment by you know, parsing it out from the clinic. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So. Yeah, you're, you're attracting people that they know what's going on already. And maybe because this is becoming more common information, their p doctors are preemptively putting their business up for sale before they're actually ready to retire because they understand it might take a little bit more time. So yeah, I understand. And what about like, what are sort of the minimums that you look for if, if you are comfortable sharing in terms of, you know, revenue and, and EBITDA? And then how big are these, are these clinics square foot wise? Yeah, so... Uh, they, they certainly range. I mean, we've got some clinics that are, are, are pretty big. So, you know, I've got one of our clinics has 24 operatories uh, wow. and it's probably 15,000 square feet. Um, on the smaller side, we've, I, I've seen, you know, very profitable clinics that have, you know, sub 2000 square feet. Uh, so there's a, there's a big range there. Um, I, I would say, you know, we're bigger is always better in our business, but sort of the minimum, you know, Revenue is kind of in that 1.5 million ish um, range, and that that equates to you know maybe 300 grand of EBITDA, um, and and anything kind of above that, where we tend to like uh, focus on clinics that have multiple associates. And I kind of you draw the analogy to you know a dentist working in a clinic are very much like engines on an airplane, right? So if you've got a single engine plane and the engine goes out, you're in, you're in big trouble. But if you've got more than one, you know, you're going to be able to land the plane. Uh, so that's another thing that that we're focused on. Um, and then, you know, the other kind of metric that I, I look for for kind of clinic health, if I could just pick one metric, it's the new patient flow, because it's sort of all encompassing, you know, of how well that they're, they're marketing, how well, you know, what their reputation is, and, you know, patient, you're losing patients every day, you just don't see it, right? It doesn't appear in the numbers until you, know, you realize two years later, they haven't been back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so th those are kind of the the, the big things that I look for. Okay. And um, you guys have eight locations that you essentially closed on almost simultaneously, or at least at the beginning of 2020. And your goal yep. 
is to get 20, 25 this year or more, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the bigger we can get, the more successful we'll be. So, you know, we're, we're really being aggressive in, in trying to identify new opportunities for, for partnership. Um, and, you know, we've got a, we've got a dedicated team um, that they, they don't work in clinics. Their, their only job is to be out uh, in the market, identifying opportunities, and performing analysis on, on what those opportunities look like and managing transactions to get us uh, those deals closed. So yeah, we're, we're very serious about growth through acquisition. Nice. And so um, you mentioned a lot of the doctors maintain their real estate. Do you guys, that, I guess that just becomes part of the negotiation process. I mean, do you have a preference for that one way or the other? Yeah. So, I mean, from a, um, you know, just a financial math perspective, we, the, the valuation of a dental clinic business or a platform business in terms of the, you know, price to earnings ratio is way lower than what real estate is typically, right? And so real estate trades at a much better valuation. So it's it's almost dissynergistic for it to be in, in our platform. So we don't ever acquire it. Uh, what we'll instead do is we'll enter into a, a triple net lease with the doctor. So, you know, good deal for them. Uh, and actually probably enhances the value of the real estate when they do that, right? Because now they've got a, an institutional, right? We've got a private equity backed dental uh, clinic company that that's you know guaranteeing that and they they don't take any operational risk right so you know property taxes go up that's my problem not theirs right if the you know the furnace breaks you know my problem not theirs right the only risk they have to worry about is us not renewing after a 10 year period right because we usually insist on a 10 year lease uh, or you know we go bankrupt right and mm -hmm. you know you've got to believe that our our private equity backers uh, you know, not in the business of, of making investments that, that go bankrupt, right? So <laughs> they wouldn't uh, do that very long. Yeah. And, they, and even, you know, they would step in with further capital to kind of save us if we did get into trouble, right? So um, it really does enhance the value of the of the asset, you know, when they do the deal with us. Um, and there are some, there's companies out there that have recognized this that are, you know, out acquiring, you know, uh, buildings that, you know, house our dental clinics, Um you know, because they can they can put them together and kind of create like a, a medical office REIT that you know can often be valued you know it's the same same kind of portfolio effect like in our business right so uh, it's a great way to create value and the uh, the risk profile is is quite good for them yeah well I I agree 100% with what you're doing you know a lot of times people think that they're throwing their money away because they're renting because they read a billboard <laughs> somewhere that said stop throwing your money away and rent but I mean it's just simply not true because you really, you really pay for is location, you know? Um, and then, I mean, obviously you guys are acquiring existing businesses, but you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. And even when you own, there's a lot of expenses that you're still throwing away as an owner, right? Um, there's very little that goes to the principal. And so like you made the distinction earlier, you, you pointed out like your return, your ROI is less on the real estate than it is on your business. So we're all limited by the amount of capital that we have. I mean, you're private equity back, but they still, want good returns on their capital. And so if you use that money to put that down payment for real estate, that's less capital that you have to go acquire new practices. And like you mentioned, you might get 20, 30, 50% or more return on that money. And real estate is typically between 10 and 20. So we do advocate for real estate ownership, but it doesn't have to be in your business. And another thing that's kind of confusing is people think that they're diversifying by owning the real estate in their business, but your real estate is valued by the tenant who occupies it anyways. And it's only as good as the lease that they signed. So yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, sometimes what we see people do and what, and what we, we help and, and coach people through is purchasing the real estate, uh, you know, signing the lease for themselves and then selling that quickly after to recapitalize. And you can make, you know, some significant capital uh, during those types of transactions as well. Now, the downside is it, you, there's no guarantee that it's gonna sell, I mean, you know, it could, could be a month or it could be a year. Um, and so you still, you want a little bit of, of deeper pockets, but we've, we've helped people and even in the DSO space, you know, put together funds and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I agree with, with your thinking on that. And, you know, just hearing you say that that's definitely a way that we could work together too, because we could potentially be uh, interested in, in buying some of that real estate, if, you know, for you guys, if that deal is hinging on the dentist selling the real estate, you know, and if you guys need a buyer, then that's definitely something where we, we would be interested in, in taking a look at that and seeing if we can work together. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and even just to further to your point about, you know, renting versus buying, like for, uh, you know, a long time, I rented my home, but I owned real estate that I didn't live in, right? And because yeah. the, you know, the, the, the return on the, the house that I was living in was, was poor. 
trying to get better returns elsewhere. So I, I totally uh, appreciate that point. It's not home, home ownership isn't necessarily the right the right path for all. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people fail to realize, okay, it, and whether it's a home or commercial building or whatever, I mean, a big part of your, you still have payments. I mean, hardly anybody pays cash. I wouldn't recommend it anyway. So part of your payment is going to principal. Sure, that's your return. But another part of it is going to interest. Another part of it is going to taxes. Another part of it is going to insurance, you know, and then you've got all these other fees along the way. So, you know, largely your expenses like <laughs> are very similar, whether you're, you're renting or, or buying. Now, if you are confident, you have high conviction that your area is undervalued or is about to see significant growth, then you might have a little bit of a different story. But for the most part, you know, that's, that's the exception, not the rule. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then how is everything looking moving forward? Um, are you guys on track to, to hit your goal or, or pass your goal? How do you see things going in the future and, and what's your like your 10 year target your 10 year timeline yeah so uh I, I i think we're we're certainly on track for for our goal for this year i think we've, we've still got some wood to chop um but we've got a you know a, a, more than a few you know deals in hand where we've got a you know term sheets executed that they'll be joining the platform um but our you know, our kind of pipeline of opportunities where we're you know, where we're in negotiations and trying to get those term sheets signed is, is very wide and you know, I'm really impressed with what the team's done uh, so far. Uh, so I think we'll, I think we'll be, uh, you know, if we don't hit our goals, we'll be very close this year. And then uh, I, I usually think about the business in kind of like a five-year time horizon. That's usually what, you know, the private equity overlords want to think okay. uh, in terms of, but uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get to, you know, a uh, hundred clinics uh, or more in the next five years. So that, that's kind of the, the goal post. Nice. Well, if you hit your goal at 25 this year, you'd be ahead of schedule. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, um, so if anybody, you know, they, they want to get in touch with you guys or they want to know more about what you do, um, what would be the best way for people to go about doing that? Sure. Uh, the easiest way, if you go on our website, uh, independencedso.com um there's a there's a little form there that you can fill out give us your information uh and someone from our team will be in touch with you to to explain what we're up to and i, I think you can actually use with the wonder wonders of technology you can actually book an appointment um you know talk to our our chief growth officer right on the website so that's it we're ready to get in touch with that's great well Awesome, Lane. Thanks so much. I will. Uh, I'll write that down and I'll put that in the show notes so that people can uh, reach out if they see fit. Awesome. Thanks for the time, Austin. Oh yeah, absolutely. Have a great one. Cheers.